freescalegorilla.com slash blog. Shake it through, baby! Uh, design Chat is a weekly uh, a professional design conversation, um, and that expands on all sorts of design fields. Tonight, we have special guest uh, Nick Campbell, also known as uh, Nick Vegas on Twitter, a.k.a. Uh, well, let's just go down the list. Here's, I got a, I got a special interview. Okay, ready? Nick Campbell, motion designer, digital kitchen, kitchen photographer and writer, Grace Gorilla.com, co-creator of ClickThatButton.com, founder of the Five Second Product uh, Project, innovator uh, at CreamyOrange.com, maker of the sweetest Mother's Day card in the world, my mom is better than your mom .com. and that second YouTube to that YouTube video. Thank you very much for providing that on your website, uh, yeah. and <laughs> and uh, and and we'll we'll get to that uh, in, in telling your story, of course. Um, so yeah. Yeah, Nick Campbell, motion designer. Uh, where do we even start with you, dude? You're a busy dude. Um, you've got Creamy Orange. You've got uh, Grayscale Gorilla, your blog. Um, you, you're putting out tutorials. Uh, your, your demo reel is ridiculous. Uh, where do you even start with you? Were you always interested in motion? I mean, how did that happen? Oh, wow, man. Uh, that was quite an intro, man. Uh, yeah, I don't know where to start after all that one. Um, Let's see. As far as motion is concerned, uh, you know, I've always, I always kind of stole the, uh, uh, you know, the VHS camera from my dad and and did time lapse and film stuff and and played around with, you know, moving stuff around. We had a re really early program too for our uh, our Tandy or our 386 or whatever the computer was. It was like an animation Disney animation studio where you can onion skin and draw stuff. I certainly couldn't draw, still can't, but I tried to draw little boxes and squares and have them animate all around. So, uh, you know, I don't know. It, it all kind of came together with that, and I did a lot of audio, um, kind of, uh, uh, I did a lot of uh, uh, recording. I was a recording engineer and uh, did recorded some bands in Detroit when I was back there. And between that and the timeline and learning computers and learning animation, all that stuff, it just kind of all ended up at After Effects. So uh, that, that's, uh, that's a awesome. quick intro. Yeah, I hit, I hit you with a lot of stuff in there. But, you know, yeah. all of it's true. I mean, seriously, when you start adding that stuff up, your, your, your online resume is absolutely ridiculous. Um, in a few minutes, we'll, uh, we'll go to your reel and we'll show them a little bit. No, let's do that now. Just for people who don't know you, have never heard of you, they should know you because you're awesome. Um, so I'm just behind me right here, everybody. I'm just going to play uh, Nick's uh, 2008 Creamy Orange Reel. Um, so you get a little bit of sound here. Everybody watch. You can tell us, walk us through a little bit as, as it's going by. Yeah, uh, wow, well, it'll be pretty quick. But uh, a lot of this work was made uh, at Digital Kitchen, where I am right now. And uh, some of the stuff was made kind of in school. And... Uh, uh, that's a personal piece. This is a digital kitchen. It's a pretty big shot. This is a pretty cool shot we did for uh, Caterpillar, I think. Uh, that's a screen vision for digital kitchen. Uh, man, all over the place. This is Target job we did here. How many pieces uh, total in here do you think? Oh man, probably uh, 20 to 30 Cut. And this is all this in 2008? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, all the work is my whole reel spanning from kind of 04 to 08. So there's stuff as old as probably 04, 05 in there. Uh, I'm trying to think of the oldest one. Yeah, we. That's screen vision again. That's. Come on, be snappy, be snappy. Hi, right, buddy. I'm just waiting for my Oh, that was the best one. Oh, uh, that was, uh, the last one was one of my favorite jobs was, um, uh, working for, uh, uh, the Muppets and Sesame Street. We did that at Digital Kitchen. Um, some really cool spots for PBS kids. And, uh, uh -huh. that was with Grover and, uh, Cookie Monster, which, uh, we got to go film out with. And, uh, those were a blast to work on, so... Anyway, that reel is uh, from probably 04 through um, 08, 
and features all my favorite stuff. And then a lot of the, the newer stuff on my site is stuff that's not on the reel. I think the reel came out last summer, so uh, it's about a year's worth of work, uh, kind of not represented on there. But um, my site has most of the other, most of the other new stuff, mm -hmm. and my blog, of course. The amount of content you have up there right now is is just <laughs> massive. Uh, it, you know, it's very, very impressive, and all of it quality, of course. Um, you, you mix it up with a lot of photo stuff. So a topic I want to hit tonight, you know, is this idea that a lot of yeah. people who are involved in creative endeavors, professional creative en endeavors, seem to, um, they take on more than one trade. You know, you, you've, yeah. like, you video, your photography also is at a very professional level, you know, even though it's sort of a hobby for you. And I'm sure there are other areas that you dabble in. You know, you're on camera. You've been in front of the camera quite a bit. Yeah. You do your tutorials. This idea that in the sort of, if you're working in a creative field, there are so many people who, you know, the successful type takes on more than just one, one thing. I mean, what do you think about that? Is that completely necessary to be successful in a creative field? Uh-oh, video seems to have frozen for Nick here. Let's wait a second. Maybe it'll pop back. Um, for anybody who's new to this, this is Design Chat number 14. Uh, we do this every week on Wednesday. Mashable has been uh, tweeting it out. It's on mashable.com slash chat. You know that because you're here. Uh, but this is also going to live live on uh, uh, designchat.info. We're going to have recordings, screens, captures. You know, um, I don't think it's necessarily uh, like uh, until, they, I, until I lose... Hey Nick, your video is your your video just froze. Yeah, your video just froze for a couple of minutes. So I was just doing another re introduction. Um, I'll I'll wrap that up for a second here. Sorry if you were just uh, talking on. You didn't know. Um, so again, this is Design Chat 14. Uh, we've got Nick Campbell from Digital Kitchen, motion designer guy, extraordinaire, photographer. Go ahead. Am I back? Yeah, you're, you're back. You're good. Um, so uh, what we're going to do is we're just going to wrap a little bit. Um, we started about da, 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 five minutes ago, would you say, five, ten minutes ago, for about 45 minutes to an hour. Near the end, we'll open it up to uh, the, the, the chat room so we can take some Q&A you know, and interact with the chat room. But we're just going to do a little uh, a discussion uh, back and forth right now for a little while. Um, so we started to get on the subject of having uh, multiple professions within your profession, multiple um, activities that you do other than you know just uh, and you started to talk about that, so sorry I had to cut you off. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Everything's fine now? Yeah, you sound good. Go ahead. Uh, okay, great. Yeah, what I was saying was, uh, you know, I've kind of taken the path of um, kind of trying things out uh, until I, you know, kind of get to a point where I think I'm pretty okay at it. And then I, I tend to lose interest in things, truthfully. Uh, as far as photography or audio or re being a recording engineer or uh, you know all these things kind of uh, coming through um, my brain I, I just kind of really get obsessed with stuff for uh, a few years at it uh, I never become the best I never become you know the best photographer the best animator or anything like that but um, I, I, I think that is as far as as far as the way I've done it is uh, worked for me um, just kind of following my passion and 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 picking up all these little traits here and there. Um, I and, and also you know as far as if it's necessary, um, I, uh, I depending on what what job you get. I think I, what what basically what happens to me is I think things are so easy to get into now. Like to get into film or photography, even five ten years ago. You had to like let's let's just take photography go so, uh so you had to go buy film, get a camera, read a book, learn how to figure it all out, take photos, and then go get it processed. Uh, maybe 24 hours later, maybe an hour later, maybe an hour photo mat or whatever. But you get your photos back, you look at them. Half of them are screwed up, half of them are blank, half of them are out of focus. You learn from that process, and you maybe pick up the camera again if you're feeling okay still and take more photos and I think today with all the technology and let's just take photos again 
With digital cameras, you could, I could pick up a camera, look at it, take the shot, know it sucks, learn from it, pick it back up, and keep shooting. And, mm -hmm. and for mm -hmm. me, that those things like really feed into my mm -hmm. personality. Uh, you know, I never would have been a photographer uh, when I what I shot. This like instant kind of gratification of digital photos and everything really got me excited. And the fact that you could put them on a website that night for you know, a few thousand people to look at is really just exciting to me. So, you touched on a, a subject um, there that I think ties in really well is that, is that um, so much of this industry is, you know, being directed by the technology of it and the technology changes yeah. and grows so fast that, you know, it's, it's a struggle just rear and if so, like how? I mean, when, when a new program came out, you know, did that change your perception of how you were going to earn money, that sort of thing? Um, well, I, I think uh, I think technology and especially like programs like uh, really get me excited about um, th those are the types of things that get me excited and passionate about things like uh, like for example when digital cameras came out and were affordable for me and then w that was maybe one thing but then when there was a technology to make it easy to post on the web all of a sudden I got really passionate about it and obsessed and, and, mm -hmm. and put up a photo a day for like three years. After Effects, uh, I was never really interested in drawing, I was, really, I was never really interested in um, traditional animation, but when I saw what you could do um, in After Effects, mm -hmm. especially when the 3D After Effects uh, came out, and I saw what the tool was capable of, that got me really, really excited about uh, making stuff. I, I tend to get really wrapped up in the tools and um, and 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 uh, lately, I've been trying to get away from that a little bit and get more into the traditional design and everything. But the tools excite me, man. I mean, when something comes out like that, when I see what's possible, when I see what other people can do, it really gets me pumped, and I want to try to make it as well. So yeah, I had a professor in school who would always say that you know you never learn the programming, um, never spend too much time learning um, how the program works. Um, because then that limits yep. your thinking. That limits you know, the possibilities that you can come up with. Um, so there's two different schools of thought. Yeah. Either know the program so well that you can exploit their powers, or stay completely ignorant of those programs and just design and create till your heart's content and find a way to make that happen. Do you fools? Uh, I... Uh... I tend to think that uh, as far as schooling goes, if you're in at least the easy stuff to learn is the software. I get really excited and passionate about the software and the tool, and I'm just going to like buy the book or buy the manual or just get into it and start pulling it apart and learning the tool. Uh, and I think I agree with the professor where it's like uh, the design will never change. Being a good designer and being a good uh, storyteller and being a good uh, you know animator those are skills that will continue um, no matter what which road you choose to go down. Uh, if mm -hmm. I decided to do websites tomorrow uh, and more and more websites, I know that I have at least a little bit of kind of design background to kind of push forward into that, where all my work in maybe After Effects wouldn't apply, right? So I, I definitely agree with, um, you know, as far as with schooling, as far as with having people teach you things for me you know i taking more design classes was you know probably the biggest uh, not taking design classes was probably the biggest mistake i made in uh, in school took too many soft, soft, mm -hmm. software specific classes that uh, of stuff that i'll never use mm -hmm. you know we had a whole class on compre on compression oh on web compression uh, right. now you know, with obsolete with Vimeo and YouTube and all this stuff that, uh, for me, I mean, more design is always the way to go. I want to ask you about a specific project, one that I saw in here that you did for the 2008 Webby Awards. Um, I think I've got it up here. Yeah. So you designed um, yeah, a whole uh, uh, alphabet, you know, a whole typeface that was animated. Um, mm -hmm. And so each one of the letters animated uh, on its own, and then when combined uh, to form different letters, each combination and spelling was a unique animation. Um, yeah. Let me just get out of the way here for a second. You see motion graphics. So, um, so these were shown uh, during the Web Awards, and, and 
and how, how did this project, how did the idea for animating the type this way come about? Um, well, the, uh, the Webby Awards uh, uh, contacted Digital Kitchen to do the title sequence and then a bunch of these uh, like interstitials type of, type of things where they needed to, um, uh, as they gave the award, they wanted the name of the uh, person up on stage uh, and, and all this. So we had, you know, a month to go deliverables uh, to, to deliver. So, um, you know, basically my thinking was this was a way that we could spend a lot of time on uh, building an alphabet, you know, letter by letter. And then once that was done, um, we could essentially make a custom animation, like you said, for each um, award winner. And what that did was was give us a um, couple legs up on on things. The first thing it solved, as far as problem solving, which I love doing more than anything, uh, the first thing it solved is we didn't have much time. We had about a month to go from when they gave us the project to it airing at the Webby's. So we didn't have a lot of time to do custom animations for all 40 people. So we knew we needed like a template. But the, the thing about a template is uh, that could get boring, right? And it's the Webby Awards. We wanted something the same template with the same, you know, where the only thing different was the name, right? Maybe it's pretty flashy up front and then the name shows up. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we wanted to do was, um, well, the two things we wanted to do is do it quickly because we only had a month. And the second thing we wanted to do was um, make it so it was unique to each person, but not so we had to build one specifically for each person. So it was kind of a way to, to do both things. We spent the, the one week building a custom alphabet. Uh, I did, I think, maybe 10 or 12 of them. Uh, and then I, there were other people at Digital Kitchen that uh, grabbed letters and did custom animations for each one of them. And then at the end, we just spelled out whatever name they needed and the animation was done. And in fact, they came to us with new names maybe three days before the show, and that was no big deal. We didn't have to do custom animation. We didn't have to do anything more specific than just rearrange their name and then render it out. So, mm -hmm. you know, for us, it was a real kind of problem solver on the time and the custom name thing. And then uh, really? they ended up using that, yeah, they ended up using that uh, kind of everywhere in the show, which is really cool to see. Uh, on the on the side, as they introduced guests, as they introduced uh, names, and basically any anything they gave us, we typed it out and it was done. So it was a uh, it was a really cool project. It was, I awesome. like that kind of problem solving for sure. Yeah, it, it's a great That's way fun. of describing sort of the the task of a designer, uh, no matter which application that they're using. Is that it's always a problem solving activity. You're yeah. presented with a brief or a problem. Or, or you know a situation, and you have to take all of your faculties and pull them together and, and find your solution. So that you know finding that time-saving idea there was brilliant for you guys, and probably the exact thing that you needed at that time. Um, now uh, we'll change uh, motion a little bit here for a second um, to some of your other online adventures, uh, perhaps at uh, GrayscaleGorilla.com, your blog. Um, okay. First off, I got I got to ask you about the name. Grayscale Gorilla. The first thing that comes to mind when I hear that is like somebody playing old school Donkey Kong on a black and white TV. Is that like where was the inspiration for that? Uh, it's uh, uh, you know we uh, th here's the inspiration from it. Uh, uh, I don't think I've told the story yet, but um, glad we, to get uh, the first we one. Had a friend. Yeah, you're in. Uh, so. We had a friend, uh, I lived in uh, Las Vegas for about a year with some roommates, and uh, we just went out there and hung out, had some, had some good times, and uh, one of my roommates was a designer, and when he, uh, he approached us and he said he's really excited about his new website, and uh, it, it was called Pixel Pig, and, uh, you know, none of us really loved the name Pixel Pig, and uh, he goes, well, you, got, you know, you guys come up with a better one. And uh, me and my uh, my smart ass friend Chad, uh, sorry, uh, we just we decided pig game. And uh, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones we come up with, uh, but they all they all were the you know something designery and then an animal, right? Uh, a digital dog, I think, was one of them. And we just started going mm -hmm. down the list of, of like funny things we could do with design terms and and uh, and animals that we thought.
we're better than Pixel Pig. And uh, I forget <laughs> what I forget which one of us said it. I, it was either me or my buddy Chad, but uh, uh, we said a uh, grayscale gorilla. And the more I thought about it, the more I liked it. And it was just an image for me. I I just I like visual names like that. And mm -hmm. I said, you know what? You can't have grayscale gorilla. <laughs> I'm gonna get it. And I went home and bought it that night. Uh, and I didn't actually, I actually owned it for, I think, uh, over a year before I uh, became my photo website. So uh, mm -hmm. it was just something I just, I knew one day I needed a website and that was going to be it. That's so, awesome. Uh, uh, that's, that's the history. <laughs> Nothing to me, it's just a, a visual I like, you know. So now it's, it's, it's containing your, your blog and thoughts and, 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 and mostly your photo life? Yeah. Yeah, uh, it started as a daily photo blog um, uh, in uh, 2003, I think, and uh, kind of the photo blog thing was just starting up. I seen there were a few online. I think it was Chromasia. I don't know how to say it, but uh, his was pretty popular, and I kind of looked at his stuff and I said I could I could do that. I could shoot stuff like that. And uh, so I bought a D70, and I, I figured out how to install. I didn't know much about the web at the point at that time. Mm -hmm. Figured out how to install uh, Pixel Post, which was like a, a photo blogging uh, tool, and mm -hmm. uh, did it and shot, um, uh, uploaded one photo per day for about three years straight, and uh, that's uh, that was kind of what. Um, Grayscale Gorilla mm -hmm. started as. And then when I decided to do it, um, I already had the name. I already had people that were interested in want, wanting to know my uh, kind of the way I'd shoot photos and use Photoshop and do After Effects. So I just did the slash blog, which is what you're looking at now. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then we get tutorials also. like the second most important button on your DSLR, which was, you know, th these sorts of insights you know, or things that are going to attract a lot of attention because you've got all these people running out and buying digital SLRs who don't know how to use anything more than the, the automatic uh, section, you know, and, and uh, you know, and there are a lot of people, and this is the internet, and, and that everybody is now a publisher, uh, that we're going to get this type of sharing, we're going to get this type of common knowledge and all of these things that have been so difficult that, like you were describing earlier, you know, uh, if you were, when you were a kid and you tried to be a photographer, you would have to buy the book, you would have to buy the film, you had to buy the camera, all the developing equipment, uh, learning process, uh, to not even guarantee that you might get a remotely interesting photo. But now we have this instant gratification of the, the camera's instant, the, the web is instant, information is instant, and you can shoot till your heart's content and not have to worry about burning up film. Uh, this is something that's, you know, of great interest this um, renaissance of learning, this renaissance of sharing information, and, and I think the creative industries are sh uh, growing, uh, benefiting greatly from it. Yeah, I mean, that, and that's really why, um, you know, being multi multi disciplinary I guess is um, it, it's like I say it's not a necessity but why not right I mean all this stuff is so easy to pick up learn about and really you know if you wanted to learn a 3d package let's say like cinema 4d or something you can come on my site do look at some tutorials figure out if you like it or not follow along download a demo and in you know in a weekend either go yes this is really great or no, that's you know not my thing. I'm gonna move mm -hmm. on to the next piece. And and that and you know it used to be that a 3D package cost you know ten thousand right. dollars to even get into. No demos. The training was uh you know thousands on top of that. You get the fat book that you know is confusing and <laughs> written half in German and you know it's it's um it's uh it, it's it is it's an exciting time you know if I wanted. If you want, if anyone wanted to just start making iPhone apps, there's ways to go a week or two. So um, it's it is it's super exciting. I think that's why I have too many projects. Fantastic going on. segue <laughs> to one of your other projects going so on easy. right now, your iPhone app. <laughs> I, I've watched a little bit 
try to figure out what's going on. I don't think I have the whole story yet, so I'm going to I'm going to have you tell the story about, you know, is this your idea and did you code it? Did you design it? What is it? Uh, so I uh, so the the iPhone app is called Shake Shake It Photo. It's um it's a Polaroid maker for your iPhone. Uh, and I came up uh, mm -hmm. I kind of thought of the idea um uh, I'm trying to think late last year I think uh, and there, there was just there was this kind of upsurgence of Polaroid you know they were talking about closing down um, and all the kind of retro Lomo cameras were, were be becoming big and I shot Polaroid as well and I just thought uh, how fun it would be especially with the uh, with the iPhone uh, to not only take Polaroids and have them look like Polaroids, but the iPhone specifically, the ability to shake your iPhone and have it emulate that uh, kind of feeling you get when you take the Polaroid and you're waiting for it to develop, you know. And then I thought, you know, um, that's such a great uh, that's such a great gimmick almost, you know. It's a we have to sit and process this photo and. The phone has to develop. I knew the phone had to develop the photo and make it. So why not kind of put some smoke and mirrors in front of it, get people to shake it, interact with it, and then have it fade up. So I got really excited about the idea, and uh, I actually I tried to learn um, I tried to learn how to code uh, C++ over a weekend. I just spent. I cleared my oh mind out and learned and tried to tried to learn and I and I, I'm not so bad with code I'm I'm not the best but I could do some PHP and HTML and CSS basic stuff I thought maybe I could get into it and I quickly figured out that it would take a year to be you know this application so I looked for a developer uh, I sent it out on my blog and I ended up uh, talking with uh, uh, a guy named Chris uh, in um, out west, and uh, he it was, he has been awesome. So I actually paid him uh, to develop exactly what I needed. I anim I showed him what I wanted the Polaroid to look like um, mm -hmm. uh, as it developed. I showed him I showed him the animation. I, I gave him the uh, audio, and uh, we worked on it for maybe a month to uh, kind of get it to where it, to where it is, and. Uh, uh, it was all working pretty well, and we uploaded it to the store, and, and uh, it's been doing pretty well. So uh, uh, it's been that's fun. awesome. And then when yeah, you take the photo, and you see it, the photo then live in your photo library that's already part of the camera. Yeah. So uh, the the uh, original Shake It photo was take a photo. Uh, the the camera pops out, or the photo pops out and it starts to develop and then it automatically gets in your um, photo library Brilliant. Uh, right right as finished with it, it it goes and saves you can shake it take another photo play with it uh, all of your photos are being saved automatically in the uh, photo library um, and then the new version actually has where you can po Polaroid your old photos like existing photos on your on your phone and then it also um, lets you take as many as you want. So it has this multi-threading thing, which uh, which my developer figured out. <laughs> so you could take a bunch in a row, and uh, they all they all get processed. So uh, it's getting better and better. And uh, that's you know, awesome. People, you know, there's blogs about it, and there's uh, uh, my buddy Joshua made a site called um, uh, PhotoShakedown.com where people can post and rate their favorite Shake It photos and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's been pretty exciting so mm -hmm. yeah I, I mean that's I so love cool. this stuff that, let's that, pause that, for a that, quick go ahead uh, sort of a station <laughs> identification for people who are just coming in or aren't familiar with us this. this is design chat number four Uh, we do this every week. It's a creative discussion uh, for professionals. Um, this week, we're, we're very lucky to guest Campbell. He's a motion designer from Digital Kitchen. Um, my name is Ryan McGovern. On Twitter, I'm at Hoopajube and at Design Chat. And 
Uh, we're broadcasting live Mason. It's a design agency, Illinois, and they've been very gracious to allow us to broadcast from here. Um, they've got a conference coming up in September called CUSP Conference. Uh, you might want to check that out. It's cusconference.com, uh, and it's going to be in, uh, in Chicago. Very cool idea where they're taking people who aren't specifically designers but have done something very interesting and designed, you know, an experience or something. Um, and they can relate their experiences to the design field, and it's going to be a very cool thing. And we're here, and uh, we've got him for another uh, half hour or so, so he can pick his brain a little bit more. We're going to do a Q and A in in about 15, 20 minutes. Uh, so anybody who's in the chat room can ask questions and uh, and do a little conversation. Um, so in the background right now, I've got one of his videos that lives on uh, Grayscale Gorilla. Dot com slash blog. Um, he's a very busy guy, and I'm gonna. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna scroll down here uh, to a kid that lives on his site that just kind of draws you in. See that red button right there? Don't you kind of want to? You just want to click that button. Oh man, uh, click that button. Dot com. What? What? Where did this? I, it's the most simple thing in the entire world, but I spent 15 minutes on my computer. Click. Uh, right. Click, click. Tell, please tell me about this. I need to know. If I don't, I'm just going to waste the rest of my life clicking this button. What in the world is this? Uh, well, uh, this feeds into exactly what I was getting into, which is, uh, uh, you know, something comes into my brain, and I just need to figure it out, and I need to build it no matter what. And, um... This is an idea that I've had ever since I had a nervous... Now, I have the full story on my blog. If you go to grayscalegorilla.com slash blog, I have a whole big post about the kind of history of click the button, but I'll give you the quick one. Uh, I used to be have a nervous habit clicking on an arcade button while I worked. I worked at this place. They just had all these loose arcade buttons hanging around, and I'd sit there just like this, and I'd click it, and I'd click the button, and I'd mouse around, and I'd roto people out, and do whatever work I needed to do. And I kind of thought how fun it would be to keep track of how many times I clicked the button, you know, like a little odometer on a on a on a on the on the bottom of it or something. So I tried yeah. to maybe I I thought about maybe you know figuring out how to go to China and build these little plastic toys like a little arcade button with an odometer on it. I hacked together my own. I cut open a uh, a digital counter. I don't think I have it around here. I, I cut open a digital counter and, and figured out how to build my own. Uh, it all ended up to be a website where I thought that would be the easiest place to actually physically build it. Well, not physically, but you know, to actually really build this thing. And ooh, people to click it. I know it just jumped 200 points. So what I wanted was one big button on the. <laughs> what I wanted was a place on the internet where everybody can doesn't do anything track. So it we have almost six million clicks, uh, which is awesome. We have and it also counts how many that you've had. Uh, you know, so you know, ideally maybe there'd be a counter of who has the most clicks. Um, you know, all this stuff. So this this to me is just the epitome of having an idea, and I just have to figure it out and finish it and learn it until I uh, made it. My buddy uh, Trevor... And this lives on the iPhone too? Yeah, so you can actually bookmark this on your iPhone, the site, and you can go to your, uh, on, on the iPhone app, and just click the button. Actually, during a meeting, I pocketed about maybe 5,000 clicks one time, so... Uh, pretty, pretty fun. Uh, you know, it's pointless, it doesn't do anything, but, uh, you know, for me, it was just kind of another uh, another project where I just knew it, I knew it had to I knew it had to be easy enough you know and I learned a lot mm -hmm. making mm -hmm. it so you know again the, the sites the sites pointless and I talk about this on my blog post but the sites pointless but the the stuff I learned making this like how to build an iPhone app um, how to make an iPhone app out of your website? Uh -huh. uh, how to uh, you know uh, do, figure out the PHP scripts and all that stuff? Um, in the site, like all, how to market the site. I you know it's all the things you learn just by trying something stupid. I just uh, I, I love I love that button. <laughs> and every time it gets close to uh, another million, I, 
I, uh, I uh, get really excited. So that's too cool. Now you talk topic. about you talk about the learning process and de delving into a, a project, um, but you recently did something that was a teaching project uh, process. Um, I'm not sure if it's, it's the name of the website, but it's uh, uh, I got FX PhD. You gave a lecture on, on how to be a motion designer yeah. and and how to get paid doing it. Um, was that the first time that you had sort of a teaching experience, and what motivated you to do that? Um, I uh, I taught my first teaching experience um, uh, after school was a quick uh, a quick little uh, uh, After Effects class at a leaving on the name right now, but uh, I had a quick little uh, kind of lesson there and. Uh, and that really got me excited about it. I didn't really have time to continue teaching, but I really thought about, um, you know, getting getting into the kind of teaching side of things. To uh, to speak at this uh, conference, it was the MoGraph, uh, the Motion Graphics Festival in Chicago, and FX FX PhD are the uh, uh, people that filmed it and uh, and mm -hmm. released it. So uh, thanks to those guys. But the whole the whole thing behind, uh, you know, how did it, how do to uh, be a designer and get paid was uh, a lot of questions that I get. It was it was basically answering a lot of questions that I get from students and and people that want to get into the design field and industry uh, and just kind of lay it all out there. You know the whole process from being passionate about learning your tool, uh, your learning what tools you use, and then also being passionate about learning the design, kind of on an effort uh, uh, make make a make a point to learn more design. And also, um, what the process is for getting a job, the whole thing about like branding yourself, marketing, getting a website, making it simple, uh, showing up at conferences, shaking mm -hmm. hands, showing people your work, and showing, showing people how passionate you are. Um, and it, it's basically all the things that we get, uh, uh, I'll, 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 end it, I'll end it this way, we go to a lot, lot of um, uh, graduation, uh, what do they call them? A lot of graduation like um, uh, festivals, when, when all the students graduate from the art school, they have, um, they have this big festival. Mm -hmm. and we go check out their work and like a senior see show if we can hire them and there's always things yeah. we c senior show thank you yeah I feel like I'm playing charades here um, so uh, you know we, uh, we we'd always go to the show and we'd always see these students that just kind of they they're good at one thing and they're not good at this thing and and they just didn't quite to get a job and mm -hmm. um, I, I I think that whole that whole um, speech was kind of for those type of people like just what do I need to do? What do I need to learn to get a job and and make money from doing um, things that I like doing? So mm -hmm. uh, it, it, that was fun. I'm looking actually to try to do that again. So hopefully soon. <laughs> I, I I I've heard this in other places, and I, I truly believe it. That um, one of the best ways to learn something is by teaching it, uh, because it forces you to explore the subject further than you would have because now you have to relay that same information to someone who might not know it uh, have never heard anything about it uh, so you have to start from square one which makes you um, and I, I would strongly encourage anybody who is you know very serious about the profession to want to take themselves to the next level um, and it's not about making yourself an authority on it you know there you should have some sort of humbleness about it when you're when you're presenting these things you know um, but if you've ever tried to teach somebody something you you learn um, that you have to reevaluate everything that you're uh, participating in uh, within that subject yeah I mean uh, I think that's why all the tutorials started coming uh, to the blog you know it, um, the blog started off as uh, I've seen pretty typical blog you know and I, I started to think you know what 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 I really like doing and what I what I can really kind of share and I realized you know maybe selfishly that I really like answering people's questions about After Effects and about 3D pack 
packages and you know schooling and I, I really like when students especially come to me and ask me a question uh, and I kind of on that it has taught me the the software but really it makes me think about um, you know what what is it that makes a person hireable and what is it that makes um, a designer good or bad is it taste or is it good typography skills or you know like what specifically is it that people should be uh, working on and then that in turn makes of course me like uh, it, it teaches me so much about it just to um, you know just to go through that mental process about what am I going to teach about or what, what am I going to teach what am I going to show what's this tutorial going to be about uh, and it's totally uh, totally like you said it, it it goes both ways so it's very helpful for me and mm -hmm. hopefully everyone else so Do you have anything lined up in the near future where you're going to be doing one of those workshops again? Uh, not right now. I have um, I have some that I'm talking with right now uh, in the fall. Nothing concrete, but if I do, uh, I will definitely check out the site. I will let everybody know because uh, you know I, the speaking gigs are another that really make me think a lot about process and what makes what makes things good, what makes things bad, what makes things successful and mm -hmm. unsuccessful. So, um, you know, I really look forward to Bob. So, deliver the speech. Let me know. I'll be there. <laughs> definitely, be definitely. Again. I'm jumping into a little bit of your photography here. You've got a, a portrait section, a street section, and a graphic section. Um, those are interesting, uh, you know, sort of... Uh, Division one, especially. Uh, how did you how do you define your graphic section of photography here? Um, uh, to me, uh, I think the 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 graphic side of uh, kind of my photos is something that's not quite a traditional uh, landscape or like portrait. Try to use texture or like the way the lighting is or patterns to uh, kind of make more of like a poster than a photo. You know. Um, uh, for me, it, you know, I don't go out to shoot these specific things, but as as they come around, you know, some photos are more landscape, street photography, and then I look at some of them like, uh, you know, like this, like this shot that you're on now is the end of a millimeter film roll, and it cut off uh, somebody's head there, so only their chin and their hair is there, um, you know, and that's the way uh, it got cropped right so to me like that's not a traditional photo and it's textural than uh, than, a, than a subject mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. so uh, you know I don't, I don't necessarily go out uh, to uh, shoot specific things I just kind of shoot what I what I see and what I like and then I come back and I think it's only later that I kind of make these choices of what's portrait what's graphic what's street what is what, street you know what's uh, to me I define street as kind of found um, found photography as I'm walking around in New York and cities, you know, just trying to to capture like what's going on around me without being too, um, you know, posy. I don't want to pose people. I don't want to set up objects. I don't want to make it studio. I just kind of walk around and, and find things. You'll see a lot of cars and trains and 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 um, you know random people walking around the city in this category. So, so, uh, again, it's I don't really go out to shoot street or to shoot certain things, but after I kind of finish it and call it all down and pick out the ones that I like, they all be buckets. Um, I find that when I'm... Oh, the website for every... I'm already on the website. It's uh, creamyorange.com. Oh, somebody just linked it. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I, I may have right. forgotten to mention that um, we've got a, a login here, design chat links. Uh, where as we're talking about things, they'll pop up and, and, and should be easy for you to click on them there. Um, you know, I find when uh, when I'm walking around and I'm shooting an event or uh, something interesting, um, I always tell people that experiencing something uh, through the lens and experiencing it as just being there are usually two different things um, because because your because your range of vision, your natural range of vision, is usually much wider than anything that you're going to see in a lens. Um, when you're walking the street and you're you're out doing your thing, do you I mean do you like literally walk around with a camera at your face, or do you see something and then and, and then think oh I can make something of that? Um, 
where do you usually see the framing of it? Is it through the lens or do you see something and then try to translate that? Um, you know, usually the camera's out. If, if I'm going out to shoot, I definitely, it's the goal is to shoot photography. Uh, it's not up against my eye, like against my eyeball necessarily, but it's maybe around my neck. I'm moving around and I can kind of guess at this point after shooting for a while what lens I have on and what range I have and when I kind of see a scene I can kind of guess at what the framing might be and if it's something that I think may work you know compositionally or the lighting is nice I'll bring the camera up and really just you know take a shot um, you know especially with digital to come up take a shot look at it and decide if it's junk if it's a place to hang out more or if it's you know garbage right away so do you have a favorite lens a moment um, uh, I like shooting with a 50 with really shallow, uh, like a 51.4, really wide open. Um, I like a, the, I have a 20 millimeter that is really, really wide that I really like. Um, and uh, I usually like wide lenses. I also have an 85, it's probably my portrait lens. It's an 85 1.4 Nikon. Mm -hmm. That thing is awesome for portraits, uh, for people. That thing is... Uh, but probably between those three, the 85, the 50, and the 20 are my are my are my babies. Do you I like uh, time, so? Do you That's now? It. I know you, this is sort of a side thing that you do, you know, and you're obviously working at a you know functioning at a very high level here. Do you make uh, photography, or is this you know strictly for fun? And um, you know, it started off as fun. It started off as kind of a cheap way to play with composition and. Um, kind of playing with kind of film, uh, but it ends up, you know, I do, I do actually do a lot of photography now at, at Digital Kitchen. Uh, so not only will I animate, um, but if we need, uh, if we need photography for a job, they'll be very quick to kind of pitch me as a photographer and go out and uh, kind of shoot uh, professionally, you know, with mm -hmm. quotes for digital, for Digital Kitchen. Um, and uh, so I, I actually have um, gotten some pretty great opportunities uh, at my current job being a photographer. So, um, in fact, the latest thing we did, which is really uh, exciting to work on, I actually, they flew me out to L.A. to take mm -hmm. photos. So, uh, you know, as far as, you know, a full, but uh, having that ability makes me uh, kind of maybe more hireable and more, um, uh, I'll be, uh, you know, more, more hireable, I guess, as a, as a designer and as an animator, just because I have that, that kind of skill. Yeah, and that kind of ties into what we were talking about at the beginning, that, you know, in these creative professions, you know, it's, it is very desirable to, to have more than one talent, because in, in one way or another, they all start interlocking. Yeah. You know, if, if you call it um, visual communication, um, that's really one of the best uh, descriptions for what some of these creative professions do. You're communicating an idea or a story or an emotion uh, visually. And visually can be image, it can be motion, in forms. Um, and, and so broadening your horizons, you know, if you're a young designer or something like that, um, this is something you definitely should be doing. Do you agree? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, I, I it, naturally with animation and After Effects, uh, I have really kind of a vectory, f flat vector style um, that I've had for a while, and I think photography really opened me up to more textural, real life stuff. Uh, it, just purely in animation terms, the ability for me to want, you know, uh, need an object that I can go take a photo of, bring it in, cut it out, and and then animate, mm -hmm. kind of opens my palette up. It opens my palette up to, you know, you know more uh, different types of design. And it also actually, uh, compositionally, just being a photographer and, and knowing what works compositionally really kind of pushed me uh, back and, and 3D, just knowing where things sit, you know, and wh how, how things look next to each other and, and, and why certain photos look better than mm -hmm. others. Um, so even if, you know, so even if uh, uh, it doesn't, help you, you know, photography specifically doesn't help you out uh, specifically for a job. I mean, just having that ability and, and using your kind of brain in another way really kind of helps out whatever you're trying to do. Um, 
we're getting uh, uh, closer to the end of the conversation here. We've probably got another 15 minutes or so. Uh, um, uh, for anybody who's uh, joining now or, or not too familiar with it, this is Design Chat uh, number 14. We do this every week on Wednesday nights, and uh, last week we started capturing the video, so that's also going to live live on uh, designchat.info. Our blessed with the presence of Mr. Nick Campbell. Um, so now we're near the end of the conversation, and we, uh, let, we're, let's do a little Q&A with the uh, chat room. Sure. Just a second ago, uh, I didn't catch the name, um, but someone was at um, Digital Kitchen Life is like, you know. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you got that job, how long you've been there, and, and, and what, that, what that group is like and what it's like being there from day to day. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I started at Digital Kitchen about three years ago. Um, it was uh, my second job out of uh, college. I got a, a, little, a job at a post house in Chicago and uh, quickly um, kind of found out about uh, Digital Kitchen and knew a few people there. And uh, they approached me to work there. And just, you know, just in the interviews and showing up and, and hanging around with everybody, I knew it would be a great place to work just because you know everybody there is like super talented I knew I wanted to learn as much as I could about design and about animation and about you know trying to make my stuff look as good as I could and I knew that would be the place um, everybody there is just super talented I could hand off a job to anybody in that place and know that it would get done with the amount of polish and the amount of attention and the amount of passion that you know uh, that I I would you know hopefully bring to the project. Uh, so as far as you know the people there, uh, I think DK's uh, Digital Kitchen's best asset. The um, they're all usually multi uh, multi talented, um, very good designers, and really um, separate from a lot of other jobs that I've had, they really give a crap about what they're doing and they at every moment right. Um, no matter what job it is, it could be maybe a not so cool job for uh, I don't know soup or something. Uh, they'll spend the time and will spend the time to like make it mm -hmm. as cool as possible. And for me, uh, for me, that's the best part about Digital Kitchen is just being around passionate people that are always trying to make it better and better and better. How big so, of a group is it? Um, uh, I think we, have, I think maybe 20 or 30 in the Chicago office. We also have a in uh, a branch in New York. I think there's maybe a hundred people total uh, between all the offices. And um, uh, as far as designers and animators go, I think there's maybe ten at the Chicago office. Uh, designer, animator, 3D, you know, types. We all kind of do everything. So. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's about right. Nick Alexander was asking, are there rules about posting? work on your site. So say you do something with uh, Digital Kitchen um, and then you want to share that. You want to show your personal website like your, your demo reel. Are there rules about when you can post that and how you post it? Yeah. Um, usually the rule is you can't post it on your personal site until it's uh, at, at aired. If it's a TV spot or um, especially if it's a TV spot you have to wait until it's aired. Uh, mm -hmm. But for certain um, for certain things for certain programs written into the contract will be very specific uh, think, uh, mandates about not being able to post it. So, for example, I can't post the uh, Conan O'Brien show on my site because mm -hmm. that, um, mm -hmm. I can't uh, I can't put that in my reel or put it on my website. I could say that I worked on it, but I can't post that specific video. Uh, there's also rules about um, private videos. So a lot of a lot of work we do isn't made for the public. It's maybe for a trade show, um, for maybe somebody to pitch a, um, so let's say a company needed to pitch a product internally. They'll come to us. We'll build them a really great presentation, video, graphic thing to uh, show their client. Uh, sometimes with those you can't post them either because they're kind of secret, you know, uh, upcoming technology mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So I think uh, we do a lot of Microsoft stuff in Seattle that really can't go as public as we want because a lot of it's future technology and proposed, you know, whatever. So mm -hmm. it's all it all depends on the contract. Uh, I kind of missed the name here, but it was something like Daniel uh, Catino. 
was asking if Digital Kitchen has a specific approach to um, to the jobs that you work on. Is there, you know, a design philosophy? Is there sort of a mission statement? What's what's Digital Kitchen's uh, approach to a job? Um, man, you know, uh, I'm not sure. You know what the what the what the mantra would be. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's always to me. It's make it as good as you can make it. Uh, there's always a problem to be solved. There's always a way to make it better, no matter how strict the um, the uh, brief is, no matter how strict the client is. There's got to be a way to make it uh, cooler than the last thing you've done. Um, and uh, let's go ahead and try to make it better than the last, you know, and, and, and mm -hmm. make it, uh, especially with title sequences and things, try to make it have, you know, more meaning than just make it look good. What's the, what's the concept behind it? And, you know, how does it interact with the viewer? And how does your mom interact with this piece of animation? You know, being on Motionographer, being on, you know, these internal sites are, are all well and good, but how do we make our work stand out to everybody you know how do we make it water cooler talk for um, teachers the next day you know mm -hmm. uh, I, I, that's a long philosophy but um, you know just trying to make it better I think um, I'm not gonna pronounce this right but it was like ice e-y-e-c-e -E -E asked you know she uh, he or she is a print designer uh, print production and she, they're transi transitioning into motion, um, are there first steps if they're looking into getting in that field that they should be doing right now? Yeah, I think if you're a print designer, you're, you're, uh, you know, you're on your way there, especially with, uh, with motion, as far as motion is concerned. A lot of what we, and in fact, the first thing we do in a lot of our uh, animations is design the storyboard. And all this storyboard is frames in the potential animation that we'll make, right? So we'll make six board, six frames in a board. It's going to start like this. It's going to go to here. It's going to go here. And as, as far as being a print designer, you really have the ability to design some really, really great looking uh, frames. Uh, uh, we call them like poster frames. These are the key, or key frames actually in traditional animation. These are the key elements of an animation where the camera may stop and slow down and really look at the frame as a print piece, right? And I, I like, I like, you know, talking to print designers that are that turn into animators for this reason. The best way to make an animation is to make six really awesome uh, posters and then animate between the two, the the six yeah. of them, right? And print print designers really have to know what looks good compositionally. So important how tight sits in the frame and all that stuff. So uh, if you're looking to get into animation as a print designer, I would, you know, make two really nice po posters that have a similar theme and then figure out how to animate between those two and make it look really sexy. Make it look, make the first frame look hot, animate, figure out how to do it, move stuff around, learn the program, and then end on that awesome right there. And that's really all animation is, is jumping between the hot points. So uh, print designers, I mean, really, we'd rather hire a print designer that is awesome at design than an After Effects geek, seriously. Um, if you're looking to get, get into it, you know, jump, do it. Jump, baby. Enemy. <laughs> uh, next one up, a uh, question from uh, Signal Noise Art. And if this is uh, the same person, I think it is, uh, this is James White, uh, who was our special guest uh, uh, just oh, last wow. week, or was it the week before? It's going by really fast. But he was at wondering, have you ever had a client throw a serious style idea uh, change in the midst of a production, and how do you deal with that? Yeah. Well, first of all, I love your work, man. Thanks, uh, if that's you. Uh, he yeah, said, yep, it's had, me. Uh... All right. What's up, James? Hey, man. Cool, dude. Uh so anyway, yeah. As far as um, clients, as far as clients screwing stuff up, yes, uh, the yes, they always do. Uh, <laughs> you know, they're uh, and you can't blame them. You know, for me, the client is paying the money. They want to see what they 
that what they saw in their head when they when they came up with it. And there's a lot of times when um, you know we'll work all week on something that we think looks really great, which and and we think that they're gonna just absolutely love. And then on Thursday when it's due on Monday. Uh, we show it to them and they say, no, you know, it's not supposed to be red and slow. It's supposed to be blue and fast, you know. Why, I, you didn't understand that. And, uh, you know, we all, we all, you know, are upset about it and we all get ticked off. Um, and we all work the weekend and, and uh, aren't so happy about it. Um, but, um, you know, really, it's, it's, as far as, as, far as uh, getting paid to do a project, it's their money. It's, it's what they want. You try to you try to head things off at the beginning. You try to say you know this is what it's going to look like. This is the board. This is the style guide. This is the text. And you try to make them sign off as, as on as much as you can before you really really start doing the hard work. But sometimes you know sometimes it changes. Sometimes they even see what they ask you to do ex exactly, and they don't like uh -huh. it, and they want it blue and blue and fast or their boss sees it and he hates the color orange so you got to take all the orange out of it so you know these things happen I, I i think you know a lot of a lot of these design chat type of things can get into that kind of hating on the clients but you know what they're, yeah. they're paying and uh if you want to do um your own thing which uh you are james uh you know you just go do it and you don't have to answer to anybody um but uh, if you're getting paid you know you got you got to make it look good for them. So, <laughs> Adrian Ma uh, asked a question just a second ago. And a uh, small note about him: he's he's from uh, uh, Beijing, China. He just moved there, uh, and uh, I've been talking with him a little bit about starting up a design chat for China. So, Adrian, if you're listening, man, I hope we get that going. Design chat China. There's a lot of people there, uh, so you might have a big audience. Uh, but uh, on that same note. He was asking, are there managers that interact with the clients or do the artists uh, get to communicate with the clients at all? And I, I find this question very interesting because I, I wonder about this all the time too. You know, wh where is the communication breakdown? If, if it was communicated that it should be blue and fast, why was it red and slow? Because there can be uh, an interpretation problem uh, between people who are doing the creative work and who are listening, trying to listen to the client uh, and, and their needs and wants and desires. Um, is that a, what, what's the setup that you guys are working with? Uh, you know, we we work with really good uh, producers that handle usually the uh, client to digital kitchen kind of uh, bridge, um, uh, and they usually almost always you know they're 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 trying to judge what the client wants, uh, and then they gather it all up, they figure it out, and then we go talk with. Um, uh, uh, the creative lead of the project which has been also talking to the client so basically it comes in like this um, the client comes in with work the client sits down with producers and the creative lead of uh, the project which is a designer usually uh, and they'll all sit and talk about what they're thinking we want it to be moody we want it to be languid we want it to have uh, this girl dancing around in it whatever it is they write the notes, they interpret what they say, and they mm -hmm. sit down, and then we then we have a meeting with the actual people that will work on it. We'll gather everybody in the room, we'll talk about what the client wants specifically. They want the girl, they want it languid, uh, and you know they'll kind of interpret what they say and give us instructions on where to go. The, br the breakdown, as far as the miscommunication can happen, usually it's usually just a communication issue it's usually just that um, sometimes the client doesn't know what they want the client wants something new and awesome that's never been done before right something totally awesome you guys figured out you're the pros you guys do something awesome and then you know we're, we'll figure it out as long as it's awesome I'll be happy so you you deliver something that uh, you think is awesome and uh, and he hates it right and is that so written in the creative you, brief yeah, make something awesome that I've never seen before. Sign on the bottom. Uh, but you know, yeah. those, that's usually it, it's it, it's uh, the ambiguous parts where the where the um, communication usually breaks down. And and the other part, like I mentioned before, the, a really really um, you can have 30 people below the boss that absolutely love what you're doing. 
They love the colors. They love the timing. They love everything. And then the boss is busy, you know, doing his boss thing. He's running a company. Uh, you know, he's the owner of, I don't know, bigcompany.com, right? And then he sees this commercial that's about to air in a week, and he goes, whoa, you didn't tell me there'd be a dancing ladies in this thing. This thing is awful. I don't want dancing ladies. I want, you know, I want it to be snappy and poppy, and all of a sudden you're whole thing changed and yeah. uh you know that's usually where the yeah. problems happen yeah and th that sort of thing happens in in the industry whether you're doing a print ad or a web design or some other sort of interactive experience um any anybody who's worked in these professions knows that it, it doesn't matter if you know you've got one day left or you know or a week if the top guy says no it's a no and, and you got to rethink it rethink it and, and you got to start from square one sometimes and, and that's one of the biggest mustering up that energy after you've just expelled everything that you have making your awesomeness you know that you think is going to be perfect and it not only is it rejected and they didn't like what you do which you have to try to not take personally you know because it is business yeah. we are being paid for it we're a creative service agency um, but then you have to muster up another boost of energy to go back and fix the problem and and I think that's where a lot of people get frustrated and end up you know dropping out of the sort of the, the creative world and they get a bad taste in their mouths and then they sort of shut off off that part of the brain and they continue just cranking stuff out that you know might make somebody happy but it's not it get noticed or, or or create an emotional reaction yeah. you know from the reader and and that's uh... and and that's uh, that's really like the worst part of uh, of of the job is when you when your brain shuts off and when you're just purely um, making uh, you know when basically the the creatives hands or the uh, the people that are paying you just want to like put their hands into you and make you uh, do exactly what they want and there's that part of the job that is really really frustrating mm -hmm. when you basically turn into an, uh, uh, a button pusher uh, your brain shuts off and you, and you move it two pixels to the right and you say is that good and they go no what if you move it up and you move it up and you go is that good and you go well what if it's green and you make it green and you go is that are we done yet or is that it are you good are you happy that's so I mean that is the most frustrating yeah. part and if I could uh, actually uh, segue into one more part, that that's the reason I made um, the five-second projects that you mentioned earlier are for the animators. Oh yeah, we didn't get to talk about that. Want, yeah, so they, like that, those that's the thing that really gets um, you know when your brain is just you're sick of doing what what your client, your boss wants. Something cool, put it on your reel, put it on you, you know uh, Vimeo or something. Show people what you're working on. And, or try out a new project. The five-second projects I made are just for that reason, because sometimes you're you're just sick of doing what other people tell you to do. You have an idea, you have a mm -hmm. vision of something that could be yeah. cool. You know, it only it's only five. Let's seconds back up for a second, minutes, actually, so, for uh, you know people who aren't familiar with the five seconds uh, projects. I think it's absolutely brilliant. I hope I hope it's a trend that continues for you. Um, uh, why don't you go ahead and give give us the you know the thirty second pitch on what five second uh, projects is and th then we're going to wrap up and, and shut down for the night. Um, sure. So give us the pitch. What is it? Well, that's okay. So here's the pitch. Uh, everybody uh, in school, whether you're in school or at a full time job, there's parts of you that want to animate something, want to make something fantastic, want to make it awesome. Um, but uh, there's two things that happen. You either want it. Uh, you're, you're in school. Let's say you're a student. It's you're either gonna you're, it's either gonna suck. Okay, if you're new, right? It's either gonna really suck, which you have to. You have to make a hundred projects before you make a good one. And you might as well make a five-second one that sucks instead of making a thirty-second one or a minute-long music video that sucks. So go in, make something five seconds that sucks. The next week, come back to five-second projects. Make make another thing that sucks a little bit less. And then the next week, make it suck a little bit less, and you'll learn over time. The other side of it, this is a longer pitch here, but the other side of it is uh, you're working all day on someone else's crap. Sometimes you just can't deal with it. You need to work on yourself, work on your reel, work on something dope to show somebody. Um, you know, 
take the five second project, take the theme. We, we have a, basically a new theme every week. You come to the site, or every other week, come to the site, you make a five second bro project based on the theme, and that thing is, you know, as cool as you can make it. Put it on your reel, show your friends, show people how passionate you are about what you do. You're going to get uh, jobs, you're going to uh, learn things, and uh, you're going to do it in a short amount of time. You're not going to do three minutes of music video. You're going to do five seconds of something cool. You're going to put it on your reel, and then you're going to make it better than that. If episode. someone wants to participate in that five-second project, where do they go and where do they find out about it, and how do they submit? So uh, right now it's on the grayscalegorilla.com slash blog. Uh, if you look on the right side, you're going to see uh, latest five-second project. You can click that. It's going to go to a page where it gives you all the directions on what to do. The basics are make a five-second animation, upload it to Vimeo, give me the link, and I'll add it to the channel. Uh, I just bought fivesecondprojects.com, and that will actually be a site very soon where all of this stuff will look big and full screen, and you could show you know show off all your work. Uh, but for now, go to grayscalegorilla.com/blog and look for the uh, latest five second projects button on the side. So uh, awesome, man! Me. Awesome. Um, the, that'd be awesome. Really glad to have you here this week. Uh, uh, just a really great discussion. I wish we could keep on going all night, but we got to wrap it up right now. Um, this has been this Design Chat number fourteen. Thanks, man. Uh, uh, we do this every week on Wednesday night. Uh, Mashable.com uh, has been sort of hosting it on their site in their chat lounge. So it's Mashable.com slash chat. And uh, so we'll be on every week at 8 p.m. Central Time. Uh, my name is Ryan McGovern. On Twitter, I'm at Hoopajube and at Design Chat. Um, you can find out more information about who's coming up and who's going to be interviewed. Um, this started as a weekly Twitter conversation, so it used to be just on Twitter with no, uh, no video. And we might go back to that uh, once in a while, uh, you know, in between some of the interviews. Um, so be beware of that. Look, uh, look for when those are going to happen. And that's kind of fun, too, because then it's, it's just the community talking to each other, and we pose questions, and we talk about one question for a while, and then we move on. Um, and it's a great way to network and meet people and, and talk about design and talk about all these things that we love. Um, so uh, wrapping up, thank you very much uh, to Nick Campbell. He's at Nick Vegas on Twitter. Uh, he's got grayscalegorilla.com, uh, and he's a motion designer at Digital Kitchen. Digital Kitchen. Um, thank you to Mashable uh, for having us and to Samata Mason for letting us uh, uh, broadcast live from their offices. It's been amazing being around this, this group, um, and I hope that trend continues. Uh, be, uh, be on the lookout for their CUSP conference, cuspconference.com. Um, that's coming up in September. Very cool event. It's in Chicago. Um, and you should just look up the list of speakers. It's amazing. I just heard tonight that there's a new guy. He's, gonna, he's one of the, the, the head guys at IBM. Uh, his, his title was something absolutely ridiculous. It was like design. Um, it was design. Uh, I'm going to forget it now. Do you know it, Andrew? No? All right, we'll get that for you. We'll post that from uh, Design Chat. Look for that. Um, but just very interesting thing. So uh, thank you to everybody. Thank you again. Uh, to Nick. So uh, wrap it up for tonight. Bye, everybody. Uh, yeah. Look for the look for the uh, design chat hashtag on Twitter and, uh, uh, and and more information coming from there. So have a good night, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks, guys. Thanks, man. Bye bye. Grayscalegorilla.com/blog. Shake and follow, baby.